Greetings all and welcome to another session here of 2Z Talks. Today we're going to be looking at English in the 19th century and how, again, the inclusion of technologies and the expansion of uh, traveling is going to change vocabulary um, and change English uh, in a great deal. At this point in time, there's going to be lots of transitions that cause for the building up of the vocabulary. Lexicon is going to be one of the big changes. There's going to be changes in other areas, but they're going to be more minor. Pronunciation being the most prominent after after vocabulary. In any event, let's uh, jump into English in the 19th century and look at some of the transitions. The linguistic translation transitions in the 19 uh, in the 18th century were very visible. You could see them actually within the writing. In the 19th century, they become less visible, but they're still very prominent. Linguistic evolution was spurred on then by uh, transportation, for example. The advent of the train in the late 1800s, coming into the 19th century here, we've got lots of words for train. Uh, and things associated with them. So, for example, we have the word rail or way or passage, uh, you know, uh, train sickness. We've got other things like macadam, and cab, bicycle, velocipede. Does anybody know what this word is? Uh, it was a word that was tried to be made popular. But if you know what that word is, let me know when you put some comments down. Uh, printing also evolved. And because of the evolution of uh, the different ways to do printing, uh, also in, cr in created uh, new words. Um, so this uh, new new influx of new words uh, made for more more uh, more publishing. In addition, there was a um, a tax on paper because years ago it was more difficult to make paper. Now, since paper is much easier to make, the tax went away. And because the tax went away, more people started printing things. And so the lower tax on paper and the increased uh, printing due to um, steam power uh, created a great opportunity for lots more printing, lots more words uh, to be put into paper. The country uh, also evolved because of the expansion of English into other countries like Ireland and India. Uh, to the British Empire. Obviously, the U.S. is also growing at this time. Australia has been pulled in. New, Eng New Zealand has been pulled in. Uh, Canada has been pulled in. So we just have this continually growing uh, zone for which English is to be the primary language. So lots of things that are just growing now, kind of like wild, uh, wild fire here. Just lots and lots of stuff that's coming up. Language, again, also evolved because things were cheaper. Uh, the penny post, for example, you were allowed to mail correspondence for a penny. And because it was cheap, people started writing more. You also had the telegram in 1837, a great way to transmit information quickly. Problem was that it cost money for every letter. So people invented new ways to say things more quickly. We do this with chatting all the time now on the, on the Internet when you're chatting. Uh, or when you're texting, uh, not because it costs money. Well, for some of you, it may cost money because it because not because it costs money, but because it takes too much time. Talk to you later, much shorter when you can just put those four letters in there, right? So that's what's happening with the telegram. They're creating new words because they're trying to get things done more quickly, more cryptic in order to get the information out. So uh, more printing displays the more differences between linguistic classes as well. The different ways that people speak, they put it down on paper. But bear in mind, in the past, things were put down on paper far less because of tax, because of technology. Now, there's going to be more and more people who are putting things down on paper. And you begin to see those distinctions. You also you see them primarily with vocabulary and then in accent. There were also more shibboleths that emerged, or maybe you say sibboleth, right? That's the difference. Words that uh, could be used as gateway words, depending on how someone pronounced the, the word. I know that for me, I often listen to the word often to see whether someone pronounces it often or often. And that to me would be a distinction. Uh, I know of people who say ask and, uh, and instead of ax, which would be the quote-unquote unstandard way. And so there are lots of words that you can use as these little gateways to find out whether you're quote-unquote upper class or not. Um, at the same time, as you see all this influx of, of printed um, information, you also have a greater influx of people trying to rein in 
trying to control what is quote unquote proper English, proper language. So they're trying to normalize and then of course marginalize. They're trying to say these are the rules and you, <laughs> you don't use those rules properly. They're trying to keep those people out. Uh, two things here that are going on during this change. The English elite, they satirize the parvenu. Okay, this is the guy, the up and comer. He's a lower class and he's trying to become more upper class. And they made fun of him because he's trying to become upper class. And he's using words improperly. Because he's not using them properly, they, he, they identify who he is and that he really doesn't belong with them, quote unquote. Um, so we have this greater influx of the prescriptivists. The people who are telling me how to use language as opposed to people who are describing how language is used. You see the two differences. Your 7th, 8th, and ninth grade English teachers were in all likelihood the prescriptivists telling you how to use language. The standard linguist is not necessarily going to tell you how to use it, but they're going to describe how it's used. You see the difference between the two, I hope. But the prescriptivists are going to stress reform. Everybody follow the same path. And uh, they're also going to be more stringent as to what words are going to enter, what words are going to be considered standard words and which ones aren't. These language mavens also understand that language changes because of the expression or pitch or emotion or age or gender. There are words that someone that is older will use that someone that is younger won't use. Uh, language for gender as well. Okay, and so they're defining all these things. Not that we need to, but that they want to. They want to rein in the language. It's got to be used a certain way. Schools now were given directives by these language mavens, and they wanted to have a greater emphasis that teachers taught proper, standard English, and that they were to get rid of their local dialects because they were considered not standard. So people who came from a different area of the country instead of London, uh, they were encouraged to not use their accent, their dialect, when in school. They were supposed to teach the king's English, proper English. Right? They needed to have control over standard English, and if they didn't know how to do that, they may have been in trouble. Um, that's what this one of the reasons why we have this transition. Okay, so let's look at some of the myths uh, that happened here, we get to the 19th century and say, hey, language has stabilized. No, it has not stabilized. And it continues even today. It changes over time. Yes, the changes are less pronounced, primarily because people are trying to rein things in, right? But it's evident in the differences between public and private writing. Good example is when you write. When you write to a friend, when you write to a, a lover, when you write to your boss, you use a different style of writing. And normally, the personal and private writing is going to be less formal. You're going to be able to make up things. You're going to be able to play with things. More formal, you're not going to be able to do that because the language mavens have now tried to force everybody to follow uh, the same rules and regulations. Published writing became more controlled as well. In the past, you could have many different ways to write things, and it was okay. Not anymore. Now the publishers, the printers, the readers, are beginning to say, hey, that's not the right way to spell this, or that's not the right, right way to construct this um, because of these language mavens, okay? Spelling restrictions continued. Words like trousers, spelled this way, or pony with an E, or labor with a U, tiger with a Y, all these were now considered no-nos anymore. Even though they were used a little bit, they were uh, discouraged to, to be used, okay? They want to rein in this in so that we can't have any playfulness with our the way we spell words. They don't want it to be done. Actuality, it was done. We're talking 100 and, uh, 120 years ago. It was done then, um, not today. Now we're locked in and we can't change these things. Yuck, my opinion. Uh, you didn't hear that from me. Myth number two, changes were limited to words and to spelling. Nope, there were other things that were going on as well. We lost a nice little... Uh, a little letter here, the S here, as in happiness. Um, it's an a, you know, it non-italicized. It would be an F, but here it would be an S, as in happiness. You'll you remember seeing it in Middle English, and you saw it a little bit in early Modern English, but we lose it all together here. It's no longer included. Uh, grammar. There were acceptable national, local, and private forms in the past, not anymore. The new rule that came out was quote. Grammar is the science of language and therefore and it 
Therefore, it teaches us how to speak and write properly. Okay, This is the belief. You may have grown up with this belief. This is the proper way we are supposed to do things, says who. Language is owned by the user. Okay, I'm not going to make a lot of friends in the, the academy when I say things like this, but language is owned by you. So you can use language in any way you like. However, you have to live with the consequences. All right. Nothing wrong with using ain't anytime you want. It ain't a bad word, and sometimes it ain't bad to use. However, if you want to use ain't in a formal uh, essay that you're going to write for a job or an uh, application into a university, you may be in trouble. They may not like that. And they have every right to say, we don't like that language, so therefore we're going to get rid of it. Um, but it is your language. Free to do with it as you please. Just remember, you have to bear the consequences. Uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans. So when you work at the academy, you better know academic language. When you work in business, you better know business language. Not that there's anything wrong with any form of language that we use. But in the situation we're in, we're going to have to modify things. Okay? Uh, in the past, things like, I were running. Oh, I were running 15 miles. Uh, every day. You understand what I mean. There's not a problem with that. We was running. We was running so fast, but we couldn't get away from from the bees. Okay, I can make that sentence, and you can understand completely what I'm saying. Right? We am running. All these would be considered legal in the past. Uh, today, they're not considered legal, but if I were to use them, if someone were to be using that in a sentence, you'd understand what they said. You might put up a little yellow flag that said, hmm, I wonder why they, hmm, or maybe I know their educational background, or hmm, maybe I know where they're from. But you wouldn't not understand what they're saying. Their meaning got across. And isn't that the purpose of language? Hmm? Teachers of that era were taught to avoid their local dialects, okay? Get rid of those. Quit using we, I, I were running and go back to the quote-unquote standard English. Some more examples. There were the wrong uses, quote-unquote, wrong uses of passive or the uses of do in negative sentences. Um, these were rules that people made up. Split infinitives. I know that you've heard of this, right? You're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition, right? Um... <laughs> Famous quote from uh, Winston Churchill when he was told about this rule, he said, that is something up with which I will not put. I will not put up with that. That is something up with which I will not put. You don't end a sentence with a preposition. Well, the people understood him regardless. We have other very famous um, split infinitives that, we, that uh, we should remember. If anybody out there is a Star Trek fan, you remember the phrase, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Well, that's a split infinitive, right? Another example would be, I expect him to completely and utterly fail. Completely understood, no problem with it at all, except that it's a split infinitive. The discrimination between who and whom. To whom are you referring? Whom shall I say is calling? Or uh, who shall I say is calling? Which one do you use? Well, in actuality, it doesn't really matter. Does the meaning get across? Yes. Whom is, uh, obviously, for an objective uh, noun and not a subjective noun, a subject noun, which would be who, who is coming, uh, to whose house are you going, right? Um, but when you put it in the objective form, then you're supposed to use whom. But again, there are many people, they don't make the difference. Who did you call, right? To whom did you call? Uh, doesn't really matter. Using everybody with singular or plural. I know there are going to be people here listening to this who are going to say, well, everybody go to the park. Everybody goes to the park. Uh, everybody eats breakfast. Everybody eat breakfast. Is it singular or is it plural? Everyone eats breakfast. Everyone eat breakfast. Is it singular or plural? And for some people, you're going to say, oh, it's singular. Other people are going to say, oh, it's plural. Well, currently, if you look it up in the dictionary, you're going to find differences. Um, I would probably say, well, what do you mean by everybody? Is that a single person or everyone? Are you talking to each person individually or are you talking as a group? Uh, depends on what it is. So we're going to have this ch you know, challenge in what's going on there. There were also changes in spelling for tense. You know, we say, I digged this, I dug that, right? Or I, the phone rang or the phone rung, which, which one do you use? Now, obviously, there are rules that are set in place, but during the 19th century, even now, you're going to find people say digged, dug, 
uh, Doug, you know, how do, I, how do I do this? And there's a, there's a rule for it, but it's arbitrary. Someone just made it up. Uh, we can change the rule. Actually, we probably can't. But it would be nice if we could. It could be nice if we could say, you know what? Dug, digged, either one is okay. I dove in. I dived in. Right? Oh, hmm, which one is it? Hmm, there's a question. It's one of the interesting things as well that the some of these grammar items that we're talking about right now are different in England than they are in the United States. <laughs> Why? Because they're arbitrary. But they're now being reined in, and you're not going to be able to make changes to them. So there are changes that are going on. Some of the, some of the language mavens, the prescriptivists, are trying to lock things down, but they're not going to be able to lock everything down. And certainly in spoken language, they're not going to be able to do it. Private spelling also hinted at some distinctions, okay? We have written down dreamed in public speech, uh, but in private writing, it was dreamt. It's quicker that way, so I'm just going to write it that way. Uh, in actuality, if I recall correctly, dreamed was on the way out in England, and everything was being moved over to, to, to the straight T and to match with pronunciation. But then what happened was... Printing got involved and everything got locked in because that's what the publisher and the printer said, and so now we're stuck with it. Had we not had any of that, most all of our language would have changed its pronunciation to be T. Dreamt. Slept. Right? <clears throat> anyway. Greater to greater, gather to gather. And that just happened because of the way the pronunciation was. People were pronouncing it the way they were doing it in their private speech, which would be the, the second area here. It was their private speech was here. And uh, so that's how that's how it was in their private speech. Public speech, they had to follow the rules, right? Um, there were also some new problems that emerged simply because a word was uh, a sound was now visible. For example, the idea if you see it, well then you say it. Then you've got words like hospital instead of hospital, and herb instead of herb, and humble instead of humble, humor instead of humor, right? Typically. Uh, before the printing of all these things, H's were not pronounced. So it was literally hospital, herb, umble, humor. But because the H started to be there, P started to be seen, well, it's there, so we need to say it. Change the pronunciation. Standard speech. Quote, it is the business of educated people to speak that no one may be able to tell in what country the child, uh, their childhood was passed. I find it interesting that the teacher is now supposed to not show their colors. Why? I don't know. I think it's a, a, a waste. I think it's very interesting that you have that past color. It marks uh, part of the distinctiveness of you as an individual and as a teacher. But at this time, they were trying to get rid of it. Don't show these things. You speak proper English. You, you speak standard English. And you teach standard English. After you leave the classroom, you can go back to whatever your other pronunciation was. Uh, we don't have that so much here in the U.S. We let people speak whatever they want uh, in the classroom. Um, but again, when in Rome, do as the Romans. You want to get into the academy, you better learn to pronounce things like they do in the academy. You better learn to write the way they do in the academy. Um, it's going to be a lot easier if you do. Would-be teachers were encouraged to dump their local dialects for the quote-unquote standard speech since their local dialect was considered subpar, it wasn't as good. Using local, quote-unquote, wrong speech um, endangers the, sta the standard speech, okay? Especially because the local is acceptable. If I speak my native dialect, I'm going to endanger standard speaking. So we need to protect it. Again, they want to protect language. Anyway, not, not a lover of protecting language. What was taught and what was used were very different. Okay, Again, just go look at novels and the way people were writing at the time. You see people were using a variety of language types. Uh, what was taught in school and what was actually used weren't the same. Right? Somehow this tells me this is the downfall of language. I don't know. Local speech, these regional dialects, were considered bad, depraved. Um, and so they were to be discouraged. This, by the way, is one reason why when people came from over from uh, foreign lands and came to the U to the U.S. to study, many people at that time were uh, encouraged not to continue speaking their language, but to blend in, to not learn, uh, not use their old language. When I was growing up, my father uh, was a first-generation Italian, and he knew 
uh, some Italian, but his parents refused to speak Italian. They wanted to everybody to mix in, to blend in. So Italian wasn't spoken at all. So uh, I lost that, the opportunity to learn some because he didn't learn enough because his parents, like here, didn't want to uh, not fit in. They wanted to fit in and be like everybody else. Um, so they wanted to shed their accents. They wanted to sound more, in this case, American, or in, in the other case, they wanted to have more of the proper English, the King's English. Uh, in truth, accent was not a debilitating factor uh, with the elite. And that's a yes and a no, because there were certain people who were parvenus. They were lower class, lower than the elites, but somehow they got up up there. And some with with flowery speech were uh, accepted within within the elite uh, uh, culture. There were others who didn't have that flowery speech and they were not accepted. Of course, there were others that were accepted because they had learned elite speech. Um, but sometimes someone had a bad uh, pronunciation and it was not good for them. I think some of this had to do with uh, personality. Some people, their personality was light and lively and accepting, and even though they, did, they didn't pronounce things the way they ought, uh, they were still accepted. Others, um, their personality was different, their demeanor was different, and so they weren't accepted because... Uh, and and uh, speaking that non-standard dialect was a debilitating factor for them. Uh, you may see this as well, uh, like I know there are certain... Um, Baseball uh, radio announcers, they're called color men because they provide the color for what's going on. They can describe very well what's going on in colorful language. And many times these people have very substandard, quote unquote, substandard uh, English uh, vocabulary or pronunciation, but they're accepted because of their personalities. So some pronunciation distinctions. Many linguists attempted to identify what these varieties of language were um, in the early 19th century because they were afraid that they were going to lose some of these uh, unique language uh, dialects. Uh, that they're, they're going to go away because everybody's forcing everybody to be to learn standard English, right? Modernization, uh, it was considered, was killing the dialects. Um, so uh, people were afraid. So the people were being sent out to write these dialects down before they disappeared. Uh, now, my opinion, never going to happen. People are always going to be people, and they're always going to get into groups, and they're always going to invent language. It's just the nature of people and language. Uh, but it does bring up a question. Are we killing dialects because of this desire to make everybody the same, right? To make everybody uh, come out of the same mold. Everybody comes out of the same cookie cutter. Um, is it true? <clears throat> um, of course, the other question is, who cares? Languages die all the time. New languages emerge. Who cares that we're killing a language? Or for that matter, who cares that a language is going away? Let it go. No one's using it, fine. A new language will come up. Something will always fill that need. Now bear in mind, a language goes away. So does its culture. So does its unique fingerprint on, on society. That's true. Um, but it's also very difficult to try to keep a language alive. So I, I don't see necessarily the benefit of it. It's going to happen. What's going to happen is going to happen. All right. But we do have unique words and phrases that are out there in these unique dialects. Take, for example, fleeches. What's that mean? All right, there's a, an example in your book. You can go find it as the snow is falling in fleeches. Well, what's a fleech? And a fleech is not a sneech, because sneeches are sneeches. Um, what's a fleech? What's a bed layer? Um, you can find out what they are. You can be, you know, you'd be glad to share them with the group. But you know, words like fleeches and bed layer, they're used in certain dialects. That's not standard English. Never was at the time. It was written down. Someone recorded it, and so we can learn about them. Um, different dialect. Yay. Uh, is it going to go away? Yes. Nobody's ever going to hear about these words again except in linguistic textbooks, unless they're being used today, which I doubt they are. Urban and worker dialects also existed. And they were recorded in journals and in diaries and in other types of uh, areas. So you've got urban dialects. You've got worker dialects because they've got, again, specialized language. They're in a separated group, so they're going to have sep uh, special uh, accents that go with them. So you see all these dialects and these differences that are plodding along now here for uh, a while. Note, words were spoken before they were written. 
duh, right? I mean, obviously. Words were spoken for many years before they were written down. Uh, some would suggest that they were were, were uh, spoken for almost 30 years before they were written down. I remember, again, being in ninth grade, and a teacher of mine, an English teacher, wrote down this, uh, it was a paragraph, an essay, all using the language of the 1960s, the flower power, uh, hippie generation language. And I couldn't read it. I couldn't believe all the bizarre words that were there that I had not heard of. Some of them I heard of. Some of the things I could understand. But there are others. Nope. I'd never seen them written down. I'd never heard them spoken. Those words are going to go away. Now, she grew up in that era, so she knew what they were. Okay? I didn't, and I'd never heard of them since. So those words are going to go away because they're not very popular. You have to understand now that words that we see, words that we use, those top you know, eight, ten thousand 10,000 words that are most people use all the time, those are going to stay for a long time. The less popular words are going to be, you know, some of them can go away. They're not going to be used anymore, right? They're no longer popular. The OED reviewed over 6 million citations. And of those 6 million that they reviewed, they only used two. There were a lot of things that they could have added that they didn't. And the OED, by the way, is a great reference for trying to identify words from the 19th century. Actually, from even before the 19th century. A uh, great many uh, words and samples and examples. I, I highly recommend that if you have the opportunity, go in and look at the OED. It's a wonderful text to try to learn a little bit more about, uh, about language during that time. Uh, we also had loan words. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Uh, we also had new words from other places, new words from India. Think of all the new things that they discovered in India. They didn't have a word for it. They borrowed those words. New words from Africa. New animals, new sounds, new smells, new new uh, new positions, new food, right? New greetings from the Caribbean. Same type of thing. Lots of new words that are coming into the English language simply because English is now all over the place. We have words that are being borrowed like baklava, right? What's baklava? Mm, mm, mm. Baklava. We have cardigan which I'm assuming most of you know is a type of sweater, but where did that come from? We have leather jacket. What is that? I normally thought it was a leather jacket, but it actually meant something else. The postmaster, a new word that was created out of a need uh, for someone being at the post. Uh, and the post is a, a place, right? And it was the postmaster. Some of these words were spoken, but they weren't offered the dignity of print. Some of these new words, and there are a lot of new words, just like I tried to explain about the the uh, the flower power language that my teacher showed I showed me. They're gone. They're not being used anymore. There are a lot of words that were uh, used at the time, but they weren't put in print, and so we're not going to have a copy of them, right? New words closer to home, they demonstrate uh, how language and the use of new words and the creation of vocabulary is just unstoppable. It is the un remitting fertility of lexus language just keeps continue vocabulary continues to be created new words and new words and new words and new words we had lots of new words coming out because of location because of technology uh because a uh, need arose because of a new situation right scientific terms also began to emerge new words that were coming up we're learning new things embryology volcanology protology petrology my bad petrology we had mixed words like chortle. You may know what chortle means. It's a combination of two words that we put together. Um, and there are more and more of these words coming out. It's interesting for me, coming from uh, a time when I lived in uh, Japan, uh, they do this a lot. They'll take two words and they'll combine them into a new word, right? So, like chortle. They do it quite often. Uh, we also have nominalized verbs. A verb that becomes a noun and then verbalized nouns okay so we have educate becoming education uh, or uh, I'm sorry that's it yeah that's a, a verb that became a noun or we have a verb that becomes a noun we have locomote becoming locomotion actually that's the other way around locomotion became yeah locomotion was the first one and then it became a verb okay we have back formations where we have burglar, we make it a noun, burgle or burglize. Absorption becomes absorb, right? They're just playing with new words. They're making new forms for all these words, right? Lots of new euphemisms. Someone would get it in the neck or pass on or did him in. Uh, ways that we can say, oh, someone died without saying someone died, right? 
We have initialisms, PDQ, an OK. It'd be interesting when you go look up an OK, where it comes from. But PDQ, you guys know what this means? Again, it was an initialism. If you don't know, I recommend you go look that up ASAP. OK. Um, and that's all I have for today. If you do have any questions, kindly shoot me some uh, comments, and I'll be glad to try to answer some of them. I uh, hope you enjoyed stopping in, taking a look at this here, and I hope to see you again. Talk to you later.